Right. Um, you also mentioned that the, the, most of the changes are happening during development, and um, this is also really interesting. Mostly, I, I, Steve, when Dr. Steve Horvath was on the podcast last time, and this kind of gets into the next section, which is like underlying mechanisms causing these changes in, mm -hmm. in the epigenetic patterns. But um, he had mentioned that, like, he's he had developed at least you know back, and maybe there's something new now. But back back then, um, a few years ago, there was a, a few clocks that he had, had used that could really beautifully measure gestational age, mm -hmm. and um, which was interesting because you measure, measuring the aging process during gestation, mm -hmm. where you've got this really coordinated program mm -hmm. that has very little background noise, right? Mm -hmm. You're not, inflammatory processes aren't going off and all this yeah. damage and you know this stuff. I mean, it's just a very clean place to like, yeah. you know, measure, measure aging. So, um, and then he's also, I think there's a preprint I saw um, pretty recently where he had developed a universal aging clock. And, oh, a mammalian. Yeah, yeah. Like there was like, I don't know how many different mammalian samples mm -hmm. that were, you know, used to, to generate the clock, and um, I don't understand everything that goes into generating <laughs> it, but um, he, I just looked at, you know, skimmed it, and it was really talking about um, the, this universal clock was also really coordinated with development. Mm -hmm. And so when you're mentioning development, it kind of makes me, it, it poses the question, like, do you think that the epigenetic aging could be a sort of develop like mm -hmm. like a program like a yeah. program that's regulating aging like is that a possibility I, yeah i don't think it was a program designed you know some people would argue that it is you know a program designed to drive aging um because they think you know for species selection you need things to age and die so that the species can range i think it's a developmental program that just doesn't really get turned off and maybe goes a little bit awry as all these other changes start to accumulate in our bodies. Um, but yes, the epigenetic clocks are really tracking something very central to development because most of these changes we can see during development and a lot of the genes that seem to be involved are these developmental genes. Um, we're still, again, not sure what this means or what this program actually is, but it it, it definitely is tied to development. But People would also argue that aging is very tied to development. So you can, there, there are beautiful experiments in flies where if you can extend kind of the, the developmental period, it extends the lifespan of these animals. And so development and aging aren't kind of two dichotomous things that we usually think of, right? That you're going through development, you hit age 20, and okay, maybe age 20 or 30 is when your aging starts. But there's a lot of great work even uh, one of my colleagues at Harvard, Vadim Gladyshev, showing kind of when he thinks this ground zero when aging starts, which is, according to him, day eight of gestation. So there's... In humans? In humans, yes. So what, When you said um, in, in, in flies, in um, fruit flies, Drosophila mm -hmm. probably, yep, um, yep. when they extend the development, can you explain that? What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think in this case, actually the study I'm thinking of, they extended kind of the reproductive kind of age of the flies so they can push flies to what we would consider like a late fecundity so they can continue, they can develop a little bit longer and don't reproduce till slightly later. How and they, How do they do that? Like, uh, they, it was more like selection. So they're selecting for flies over generations that are going to be so these later fecundity flies and they show that they also live longer in the end. Do they do genetic, like is it a genetic? Yeah, yeah things exactly. That, genes that are controlling it? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, a couple of things here then, back back to this. It's very interesting, the development thing, and a, another thing came to mind from the conversation I had with Steve was he had mentioned, like if you take a cell um, that has not been immortalized in mm -hmm. tissue culture, yep. and then you immortalize it with a component of telomerase, TER, mm -hmm. yep. and you essentially overcome cellular senescence, which yeah. is one of the hallmarks of aging, right? When a yep. cell undergoes senescence, I mean, it's pretty much not, I mean, it's still metabolically active, but it, you know, it's considered sort of the end, right? Yeah. Um, and these cells, they're epi if you can, you continue culturing them in tissue culture, and they just their epigenetic age just keeps going, yeah. and going and going. Yeah, we're actually doing this exact thing in my lab right now, where we we use HTERT to immortalize cells, and we are just seeing how long. Like there has to be some saturation. Like eventually, 
can it just continue to change forever? I think too, people haven't looked at things like HeLa cells, which have just been changing. <laughs> you know, they've been evolving for decades. And like, at what point does the epigenic age kind of reach a saturation point? And again, I don't think we know. But yeah, definitely with these immortalized cells, with every time you pass it to them, their epigenic age keeps, at least it seems to continue yeah, to increase it's, over time. It's interesting. And um, sort of on the flip side of that would be, like, like you mentioned, like is the epigenetic, are the epigenetic aging clocks biomarking something, like mm -hmm. the, something else that's causing aging? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, a study that you were a co-author on, I, this, I was kind of, as I was preparing for this podcast, I was thinking about it, and I was like, you know, well, in my mind, I was like, well, what, how could you like cause something like that would be massive damage mm -hmm. uh, to accelerate aging? And so I, I Googled uh, chemo th cancer chemotherapy epigenetic clock and like your paper you were a co-author came up on. I was like, oh, this is in Morgan's on it. Okay. So I was reading the paper and these patients that had head and neck cancer mm -hmm. and they were getting treated for it, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, mm -hmm. uh, they, were, um, they were treated, you know, which causes massive damage, inflammation. Mm -hmm. These patients, um, their epigenetic age was measured before the treatment, after the treatment, and then six months later and a year later. And it was so interesting to me because they had aged, like their epigenetic age had accelerated by 4.9 years right after the treatment. Mm -hmm. But then six months later and a year later, like their epigenetic age had like normalized back to baseline. Mm -hmm. And um, a sub-analysis then showed actually not only did the epigenetic age acceleration of almost five years correlate with inflammatory biomarkers, mm -hmm. but people that were that had extremely high bio, inflammatory biomarkers one year later did still experience mm -hmm. the um, age acceleration. So um, I'm curious as to what your thoughts are on what that means. Like, does mm -hmm. that to me, I mean, to me, I look at that and I go, wow, inflammation is causing epigenetic age, age acceleration. Uh, mm -hmm. Because yeah. you see this like graph, right? I mean, yep. so. Yeah, I think definitely when we measure aging in blood, we had to think, you know, what is, you know, probably driving these these signals that we see. And I, I would guess that epigenetic age acceleration in blood is mostly reflective of inflammation, unless, again, you're developing a clock that's specifically tuned to some other thing. Although inflammation seems so, you know, vast and systemic, it, it affects so many different things. Um, but I don't think everything that epigenetic clocks are capturing is inflammation, because again, uh, when you look at immortalized cells, it's not because they're becoming more inflammatory every time you're passaging them, per se. But definitely, I think epigenetic aging measured in blood is very much tied to inflammation, which again is probably why it's highly predictive of a number of diseases, which we know inflammation can be a major driver of. Is that where um, the extrinsic and intrinsic aging clock, or I don't, I don't exactly, yeah. like one of them considers the external factors in blood and one doesn't or something. Does, inf yeah. does inflammation calculated in that or not really? Is it sort of? Yeah, so these are two of the first generation clocks. So I think, you know, Steve kind of called them intrinsic, extrinsic aging. Um, I think he called the original Horvath pan tissue clock was the intrinsic aging. It wasn't um, that tuned to differences in kind of cell turnover or inflammation. Um, whereas a uh, clock he, that was developed by um, Hannum et al., he kind of added these different kind of cell composition measures that it, it actually ended up picking up inflammation a little bit better. Um, but this was before these second generation clocks came into being. And then I think once they came into being, we, they're probably picking up inflammation a lot more um, than even the first generation clocks. And, and again, we can make these kind of systems clocks, and one of our systems is inflammation, and it is, we can show that it's highly, it's highly predictive of outcomes. It's definitely capturing things related to inflammation.